Hi, congratulations on being admitted and accepting your admission to Purdue University and the Polytechnic Institute, and we wish you the very best. So welcome and congratulations. Hi, welcome to the Office of Recruitment, Rotation, and Diversity for the Polytechnic. Hi, congratulations. We are here to help you with your college journey. Please stop by anytime with questions or just to say hi. We're in Kanoi 150. You can also call, email, tweet, or follow us on Snapchat. We want to answer your questions, so send them in and we'll help take care of you. But first, accept your offer. Check your email. And if you haven't been here in a while, schedule a visit. And one more thing. Congratulations! Good evening, future techies, and thank you so much for joining us tonight for this YouTube live broadcast focusing on academics within the Polytechnic Institute. My name is Ryan Kirchner. I'm the Associate Director of Recruitment here for the Polytechnic at Purdue University in West Lafayette. We have a few poly, uh, panelists joining us today as well with uh, academic information um, to give you the understanding of what's going on in the Polytechnic and, and how you can make that choice to join us here at the college. I'll have them introduce themselves here in a little bit. But I just want to talk about a couple of things just to make you aware of. Um, if your chat function in the YouTube live broadcast is not currently working, go ahead and refresh that page because that will bring it back up. And then you can submit questions via chat uh, that we can respond to. We have several student ambassadors that from our various departments who will be responding in the chat, as well as if we want to bring in those questions to the large group to talk about, we'll do that as well. Um, make sure you just log in with your Google account to be able to submit those chat questions through the chat function. Um, and then we also have this broadcast as well as previous broadcasts and other videos on our YouTube channel. So feel free to look through those things, uh, review all the information that's through those videos and really get a good sense of what's going on here in the Polytechnic since unfortunately you can't visit with us uh, in person. So we're bringing this to you to make sure we try to get that information and answer those questions that you have as well. Um, so with that, uh, we'll have our panelists introduce themselves. Uh, so Tamara, would you wanna start please? Sure. My name is Tamara Grohl. I'm an academic advisor in the School of Engineering Technology. I have been an advisor for about a little over six years now, and I love it. I love my students. It is all wonderful. We have a great time. All right, and then Melody. Hi, my name is Melody Carducci. I'm an academic advisor in computer and information technology in the Polytechnic. I'm a new advisor. I've only been advising since October, but I've been at the university for 10 years. Um, mostly working and teaching in online education. And Mark? Hi, I'm Mark French. Um, I'm a professor in mechanical engineering technology, and I've been here since uh, 2004, so 15 years now, working on 16. All right, great. So we have a couple advisors and a faculty member, so we're going to give you a good sense of what's going on in the academics here in the Polytechnic. And so we'll start there with, with a couple of our academic advisors, um, just to kind of give you an idea of what the plan of study looks like for your department. Um, so kind of give a quick rundown of what that looks like um, for our students. And, and Melody, we'll start with you. Sure. So we have four majors in my department, and uh, our plans of study are intentionally built so that you really don't have to choose which concentration you wanna focus on or which major you wanna focus on. Our uh, core courses are the same across the four majors. Um, we anticipate that you'll take 15 to 16 credits per semester in order to graduate in four years. And we do incorporate a um, uh, IT professional experience as part of your plan of study and that's a requirement for degree for our department. All right, we'll actually get into that professional experience requirement a little bit too. Uh, so Tamara, what, what would one look like for the School of Engineering Technology? School of Engineering Technology has a little bit more to it. Um, we actually have four, as we call them, umbrellas. And underneath each umbrella is at least one to four different majors. In total, we have about 10 different majors that students can choose from from the School of Engineering Technology. Our first semester, um, in essence, our first year is fairly similar across the board, the first semester especially so. It's not that difficult if you're not 100% certain where you wanna go to start with one and make a change to a different one. Maybe something else is more appealing to you and you're not gonna lose any time or any credits as you do things. Um, 
we do have a lot of opportunities for dual degrees as well as minors. It's very easy to fit these things in. Uh, but usually once you kind of sort of settle by the time you get your sophomore year, it's a good opportunity. That's a good time to say, okay, I think this is really where I'm happiest and this is where I want to be. And as I know, we're going to talk about the senior design later on. We have that professional experience as well, as well as the internship requirement that can be satisfied with the profession with the uh, capstone. Okay. And uh, Tamara and Melody, you both mentioned there's some common coursework between your majors and your departments. Is that similar with other areas, other departments in the Polytechnic as well? Would you say, Tamara, would you respond to that? I, I think that they actually are. I think for, for many of the majors underneath that particular heading, maybe it's aviation or it's construction management or whatnot, or, or computer graphics technology, they're all going to have, especially that first semester, a fairly common core bit of classes that would then transfer to other ones as well. Sorry for my clock in the background. <laughs> we have uh, university core requirements that are built into our plans of study, and those are common among all the departments and all of the majors, things like your math, your social sciences, your um, economic selectives, communication selectives, things like that. Those are required across all the departments and all the plans. Okay. That is true. Um, yeah, okay. And and Tamara, you had mentioned usually by the sophomore year, that's when students would typically you'd want to have them solidified in their major. Um, is that that's pretty safe to, to say for most of the majors in the polytechnic as well? Pretty safe to say, I would I would argue. I think by that point in time, you're really starting to get into your more interesting classes, your classes that are going to be more major specific. Mm -hmm. You could probably still make a switch. But you might be losing a little bit then you might be losing a little bit of time adding on a little bit of time we may not be able to use all the courses but of course we're always going to do our best to utilize as many course options as we can to make sure that students are not that they don't lose time simply by changing their major or discovering a new area of interest okay very good and there's some technical selectives and electives built into plans of study and, and melody how did that how would that work with some of your majors so with our majors, um, cybersecurity has what are called cyber selectives. Those are elective courses within the department that focus on um, more specific areas of cybersecurity, as where with our other majors, uh, the general tract or the networking track, um, we have more general IT selectives, which then would allow students if they had an interest in one of the other majors, say, to pick up a group of courses that would give them more of a background in that particular area. Um, it also allows students to maybe reach out and take some CGT courses if they're interested in maybe picking up a little bit of, of computer graphics info, you know, information and skills. So it allows them to design their major to fit most specifically with where they see their career interest going. Okay. And do those electives potentially lend themselves to uh, a double major or minor certificate programs as well? Melody, you want to kind of respond to that? So we have what we call interdisciplinary selectives that are required, which is different than our IT selectives. So our interdisciplinary selectives are typically satisfied by a non-computing minor. So uh, many of our students, for example, might choose to minor in communications which not only fulfills a lot of their university core requirements, but it also would fulfill some of those interdisciplinary non-computing uh, electives that are built into their plan. Um, our students typically pick, can pick up the cornerstone certificate through liberal arts fairly easily. It's built into our plan in that almost all of the courses for cornerstone also satisfy another requirement within our plan. Um, so there's lots of options for students. And, and uh, Dr. Rawls likes to tell students that um, you can apply IT to any career field out there. And so he encourages students to pick a career field they're really interested in and besides IT and minor in it, and then discover how they can apply their IT skills to that minor area of interest. Okay. And Tamara, how would, how would you say minors or double majors work within engineering technology? All kind of depends which way you are looking and what you are wanting to do. Underneath certain umbrellas, for example, the manufacturing umbrella to do a double major between robotics and mechatronics, 
not that difficult. With careful planning, it might only add two, maybe three classes. And if you've got some credit that you bring in, you can do two majors within the four year time frame. So it's very simple to do. And other students have added on then the electrical minor as well, because again, it fits very nicely. All of our plans are super adaptable to the entrepreneurship certificate. Mm -hmm. All of our students can take that option if that's something that they're they're willing, they want to do. That's an option that's available for them. Um, again, it just kind of depends upon where the area of interest is. Uh, to do a double, for example, between me mechanical and electrical, that will add on time about a year and a half. Maybe only a year, always dependent upon what are we working with? How much credit do we have? What's going to, what's the overlap we can utilize? Okay. Um, and one thing I want to point out, um, John, who's our technical director, he's probably going to be sharing some links, some URLs to some of these websites that we're kind of referencing. All the plans of study for all of our majors are online, so you can take a look at what a potential four-year plan is going to look like, where those electives fall in, do some comparison between the departments and the majors as well to maybe find some areas that you want to double major or find those minors on our website as well that we offer in the Polytechnic. That's a great resource to take a look and, and see kind of maybe how that plan would look. Um, and, and one thing that I think we, we started to incorporate and maybe required is a, is a senior capstone project is that see or senior design and Tamara, do you want to kind of explain what that looks like and is that part of the engineering technology as well. It's definitely part of the engineering technology. We have a professional requirement, which can be satisfied with that senior capstone that that it's a year long industry sponsored project. You have an industry mentor. You're given a real problem that they are facing in industry today, and they're looking to you to come up with a solution. So it can be very exciting, very gratifying for the students. The students get a lot of networking involved with it. Um, I know students have been hired off of their, their senior design projects because of the work that they've done. Um, again, like I said, it's a year long project. Usually the first part of it, you're analyzing your problem. You're trying to come up with some ideas, doing feasibility studies, brainstorming. Second part of the year, the second semester, you're actually involved in the build of the solution for what the company is looking for. These products, projects we have found to be very rewarding. Students have found them extremely applicable to future work experiences. And again, it's a requirement. We do have one major that will allow a different alternative for the senior capstone project if you have additional work experience. So we can work with some things, but overall, it's a great experience and the students really seem to enjoy their projects. All right, great. Right. And nobody has that look for the CIT. We don't currently have a senior capstone project per se. Um, we sort of encourage students through their internships um, they provide a reflection to us about how their coursework applied to their internship and how they have been able to utilize their studies in the work workplace. We do have a senior design course that's uh, 480, but it's not a capstone course per se at this time. Okay, gotcha. Um, and, and Mark, I'm going to bring you in uh, since you've kind of been in the background for a little bit now and, and maybe get some of your perspectives on um, some of the courses and how they are designed within the Polytechnic. So we've talked about plans of study overall, the large scope. Um, so how, how is the, the coursework designed within your area and then kind of how it looks in the Polytechnic? Oh, wow. Um, big question. That's a very general question, yeah. but, you know, um, courses, labs, lectures, how does that work? Okay. Projects, things along those lines. I'm, I'm in the mechanical engineering technology program, and that's one of, I don't know, like eight or 10 programs within School of Engineering Technology. Um, we try to maintain a, a balance between uh, classroom work and lab work. Uh, with a, it's a very heavily lab based. Uh, way of learning so that uh, if you if you uh, learn best hands-on and a lot of people do we try to make sure you have that framework so that the that when we go into the classroom you've got some something to base your understanding on you're not uh, we, we, we try to avoid teaching theory first and applications only later that uh, it doesn't suit our students very well and uh, that that way of, of teaching pretty much runs all through the School of Engineering Technology. And one of the, hang on a second here, <coughs> pardon me. Um, one of the uh, uh, 
big motivating ideas of the, the Polytechnic Institute is learning by doing. And uh, we're, we're trying very hard to implement that in as many of the classes as we can. Is that, is that enough? Yeah, I think so. Just, you know, again, kind of going to that, the hands-on education that we have. And that's, like, I think that you covered that within the Polytechnic Design and, and what we're doing. I think Tamara may have something. And if I can just interject as well, one thing that I think is very interesting for students is that they are often in lab from day one. They start off as freshmen and we put them straight into a lab so that they can immediately get their hands busy, not just get their hands busy, but they can they can start seeing immediately what they're going to be working on and what they can do. And that we have found for students to be extremely beneficial for them to really get a handle on the way that we teach and what we do. Most of our classes have a lab component. And that is, I hear from a lot of students, that's their favorite part of it is working on the projects, working on the labs, maybe not when all the projects are due at the same time, but they really enjoy the projects, they enjoy the group interactions, they like what And, and Melanie, would you say it's, it's very similar in CIT? I would. We, our students, uh, even our first semester freshmen are in a lab course. And they are um, often telling me how much they enjoy putting things together, taking things apart, understanding the mechanics behind the theory. And um, they, they oftentimes come with an idea about what IT is. And I think we allow them to see beyond what they may have experienced as IT before they came to the university. All right, very cool. Now, um, and we talked to briefly touched on internships and that professional experience and Tamara mentioned that the senior capstone can can satisfy that requirement. And so for CIT, what does that look like? Is there a certain number of hours or type of work they needed that students need to be doing? Sure, we don't limit them necessarily to type of work. It does need to be IT based. Um, I've got one student right now who's interning with Tesla, which I think is just as cool as all get out. Um, they can intern or intern at any company as long as their duties are going to be based in IT. We have students who intern with the FBI, with the um, the uh, IRS, um, State Farm, um, Chrysler, Caterpillar, General Motors. I mean, they're just, they're all over the map as far as the different kinds of companies that they intern with. Intern with. We, some of our students even complete their internships with ITAP on campus. So it doesn't matter whether the company is an IT company or not. It's just as long as their duties as a, for their internship are IT related. It's 240 hours uh, minimum that we ask them to have certified that they've completed. And then we do have them write us a three page reflection paper for that IT experience and it's due by the 12th week of their final semester. Um, we don't put any requirements on that paper. As far as content, we just want to know what the internship meant to them what they learned from it and what from their classwork can they take away from that experience and grow with. Okay, that's that's good to know. Um, and and Tamara, um, so you mentioned the welcome back. I think your video is out for a little bit. Sorry about that. Uh, so the you said the senior capstone can satisfy the professional work experience requirement. Outside of that, what is the requirement? Internship, co-op. What is there a certain number of hours and type of work that students need to have? We don't have that set requirement. We definitely encourage co-ops. We encourage internships just because everything adds to what the student's learning, they get another opportunity to uh, apply what they've learned to an actual situation. Uh, but that being said, sometimes it's not the easiest to find an internship exactly the way that you want it. Um, so we don't have that specific requirement. If a student does do an internship, we do have an internship verification form we want them to fill out and return to us. Um, again, we only have one major that an internship will get you out of the capstone. Otherwise, we want everyone to participate in the capstone because we think it's such a worthwhile experience. Right, gotcha. Um, and this, is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring this uh, back to Mark. Um, 
what types of industry connections would you say faculty have here in the polytechnic to help our students and and other ways that our students find internships and, and experiences to to get out into industry well there's um primarily it's two different uh uh connections the first is that our, our professors in, in engineering technology anyway are kind of unique in the university and that almost all of us have had industrial careers before we came here. Um, I came here in 04, but I'd, I'd been an engineer for almost 20 years by then. And so I had an awful lot of time spent making my living as an engineer that, to, uh, you know, bring that into the classroom. You know, the, the making your living as an engineer is not a, is not a theoretical idea to me. And most of us have that, uh, so maybe not that much background, but a lot. And the other one is that we're uh, strongly encouraged to find uh, research or development projects with companies as part of what we do. Um, I've had, oh, I don't know, three or four long-term projects, and I'm also on one called the Technical Assistance Program. Uh, it's a state-sponsored program where my students and I go out and do 40-hour uh, jobs for companies all around the state. So I've had, I don't know, something like 140 of these now, everything from wire drawing to engine rebuilding. Um, we helped out a harp factory one time, you know, the, the musical instrument. So all we're all over the place. And then so my, my, these are graduate students who work with me, but when they get on that program, they get that experience too. So I'm sending students out into the workforce who maybe worked with a dozen companies in, you know, while they were still at Purdue. Um, that's that's pretty that's pretty impressive. They have that those types of connections as their students here getting out there. Um, and I, I just want to point out that the Polytechnic does have several different career fairs that happen throughout the year as well. Um, information sessions that are hosted by individual companies. So connecting our students directly with them with recruiters trying to help them find internships and, and then eventually those full time jobs as well. And Mark, you want to add something else? Yeah, I just I just realized I can give you a, a, a good specific example. Um, one of the things I work on in, at Purdue is musical instrument design. I'm a, I'm a guitar guy. I'm a guitar builder, not so much a player. In fact, if you look at my, here's, I didn't have to reach very far to find this on my wall. So it's, I must be serious. That one's all, I've hot rotted that, made you know, all kinds of oops, modifications to it. But I've got uh, connections with the guitar industry and I'm working with them on a pretty regular basis. So my last undergraduate lab manager now works for Fender Guitars in Corona, California. Wow, that's that's pretty cool. That's um, an example. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, that's a great example. Like a real specific industry connection right there for sure. Um, so Mark, I think we're getting some questions in terms of what's the difference between engineering technology and the College of Engineering or engineering uh, academic programs. How would you describe that difference for students coming into these programs here? Um, I, we get this question a lot, and it's a, it's a very fair question. Anybody who's paying attention has probably wondered. Um, it's the the differences in our our take on the problem. Um, engineering school is traditionally taught in a very science based way. That started in the '60s for historical reasons. And so I was trained as an engineer. I went through school in that in that mold, and it was uh, deep on theory. I came out very theoretically well trained, but without much practical experience. There was there were a lot of very basic things I didn't know, um, and we're we're coming at it from kind of the opposite direction. We're trying to make sure our students get to the uh, the workplace ready to work right away, uh, and that generally works out pretty well. Um, we listen very closely to our industrial advisory council. When they ask for anything that's even halfway reasonable, the answer is almost always yes. And we, we're very attuned to the needs of our employers. Um, if there's a disadvantage to it, it's that if, if uh, uh, one of our students goes into a job that requires kind of a, a deeper theoretical background, they may have to do a little bit of additional training, but that's very seldom happens. Um, one of the things we hear from our uh, employers a lot is that our students are able to get to the job and be productive right away. And um, 
it's, uh, I want to be clear that this is just two different takes on the problem. The, the, the folks over in engineering are very successful and they've earned every bit of it. So it's, it's uh, uh, one's not necessarily better than the others. One, one, one approach suits students and their needs uh, better than others sometimes. All right, good, good to know. Um, and, and actually, Melody, we're getting a similar question um, and we get this a lot too. How would you describe the difference between the CIT department and computer science? So um, I'll have to try and channel uh, Phil Rawls a little bit. He says that um, people in CS can write code all day long and that's all they do. While people in CIT get to play with all the cool toys and make the toys do things by using code occasionally. And that's the best way I can describe it. Um, they get to play with um, applications for smartphones and they get to play with um, wiring smart homes and developing ways to apply IT to make life easier, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity. Um, these are all things that CS doesn't really delve into because all they do is write code. They just program things. And CIT grads um, listen to customer needs and develop solutions using objects, programming, networking, the toys to solve those problems for the, the customers. All right. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and and we John's been sharing a couple of links that we have uh, for online resources with comparisons and with uh, our between CIT, our CGT Computer Graphics Technology Program, and Computer Science, as well as a little more um, detailed, you know, kind of more specifics about the engineering technology difference and the approach that the Polytechnic takes as well. Um, I also want to give a shout out to all of our student ambassadors who are responding to the questions in your chat. I think we have over 300 people currently watching our chat or our broadcast right now. Um, so. Please be patient and, and just know that we're going to try to answer all your questions. We may not get to everything tonight, um, but we're going to I'm going to talk about some other resources when we when we wrap up at the end of this of, of where you can go to make sure you get answers to all your questions. Um, and then I want to throw it back to Mark, um, just kind of talk about how do faculty get connected with students? I know obviously you're, you're teaching in the classroom in the labs. Um, you know, how do you connect beyond that? Where, where can students turn to if they have some issues or struggles with, with some of the things they're learning in your classes? different ways. Um, the, the obvious one is that we all have lab or uh, office hours and some of us just have open door policies. So the, the obvious thing to do is go to one of your professors and ask a question and if they don't know what the answer is, they'll find somebody who does, probably steer you to another faculty member. Um, I've never even heard of a faculty member sending away a student who's asking a question. I just, I don't, uh, maybe it's happened, but I sure don't know about it. I've certainly never done it. Um, can, can I tell you one of my most rewarding moments? Uh, Absolutely. Student, this was a long time ago. A student came in with his roommate and said, well, my, my, my roommate here has a question for you. And I said, okay. He goes, well, he's not actually an MET. And I said, fine. He goes, he's not actually in this college. He's in, he's in, in another college. He's in engineering, I think. I said, okay. And he asked a question. Thank God I knew how to answer. And so, you know, I got him his answer and sent him on his way. And as they're walking down the hallway, I overheard the, my student tell his roommate, see, told you. And that's, <laughs> that's no, I mean, that's when we, when we get it right, that's what it's like. Um, there, but there are lots of others there. We have student organizations um, who do all kinds of cool stuff and they all have uh, academic or professor or faculty advisors. That's another one. Um, we're encouraged to involve our students in their, in our research work. So we have undergraduate research assistants in a lot of cases who get to do things you know, far outside of what they would normally do in class. So there's another one. Um, I run the guitar lab here on campus along with another faculty member. And we're, we're off site right now and we're going online and things like that. But when all this finally settles down, um, you know, the place is open. Students can come in there and make stuff. Once they convince us they're not going to cut their fingers off or break our tools, we pretty much got the run of the place. And uh, I, every semester, I have kids who come in and want to make a guitar. Okay, fine. Let's, let's do this. And 
you know, the ones who finish, all right, good. Now you're, now you're in the club, come back and make as many as you want. Um, uh, we have you know, the Bechtel Innovation Design Center that students can make anything they want. Um, well, it's is legal, I guess. But uh, I mean, if that is something like that had existed when I was an undergraduate, so God, it never left. You had to burn me out of there. And uh, so there, there's all kinds of, of resources on campus and all kinds of, well, lots of different ways for students to connect with professors. Now, the only thing is they're probably gonna have to make the first move. Um, we have uh, we have an awful lot of undergraduates, and I don't think any of the professors are going to go out and just walk up to a bunch of students and go, "Hey, is there anything I can do for you?" Um, we're you know I would like to, but that's probably not reasonable. But that's okay. Come to us. We're you know we're busy, but we're not that busy. We know who our customers are. All right, that's good to know. Um, and kind of going a little bit further into your role, Mark, and maybe some ideas about research. And a lot of undergraduate students come in wanting to do some research and get involved with the research process. Um, how does that look with, within the Polytechnic? What kind of opportunities for undergraduates are there for getting involved with research? Oh, uh, man, probably too many to count. Can I give you the example of one I'm working on now? Um, sure. Yeah, absolutely. A young lady in, in MET who's, I think, getting ready to graduate at the end of the semester is in a, pro a project called LSAMP. And there's all these different projects around campus. And they're, they're constantly looking for undergraduates to be involved. And this is a, a, it's a Lewis A. Stokes Minority Participation, which I think is what LSAMP stands for. I get that right, Tamara? I think so. I have a student in it too. Okay. And so, you know, the, uh, the young lady's name is Cass. And so Cass came and asked if she could do a project with him. Well, she's a great student. Of course, the answer is yes. And so I had a, a project in mind that I needed to do and didn't have time to do. So she and I started meeting every week and she's getting, I think, a little bit of funding through them. And uh, she's right before we broke for uh, left for spring break, she finished all the data collection. Now she says she's going to be back in a couple of weeks. I don't know we'll, with the virus thing going on, we'll have to wait and see. But her product for LSM, but she now has to make a poster for a poster session explaining the research and what, what she did. But we're taking it a step farther than that, that she and I are writing a paper on it now, and it'll go in either a, a conference or a, a musical instrument journal. Because the data, you know, that I, I basically told her, well, you know, here's, here's the data I need, you go get it. And she, she took it and ran, and the data set looks pretty good, and it's unique. I don't know of anybody else in the world who's done what we've just done. And, you know, there's seven and a half billion of us wandering around Earth. It's, it's awfully hard to have a truly original thought. But uh, we, we, we may have a data set that, that's unique enough to be of real value to people in this industry. Yeah, I think that getting that research experience is, yeah, like you said, it helps you kind of stand out when you're, when you're looking to get those jobs eventually, yeah. Um, yeah. Kind of, I'm going to turn it back to, to Melody. We've had some some kind of questions specifically about cybersecurity um, and potential certifications um, that come with that IT area. Are there certifications that if students receive or earn before they get to Purdue, does that help with any eliminating any coursework, um, kind of getting that out of the way for them in any ways? Um, the answer to that is no. Um, students can come in with some net for the networking major, the net major where they can have some certifications and that might put them in a position to test out of a few courses. But cybersecurity certifications, I'm not aware of any that will get them out of coursework for the cybersecurity bachelors. Okay, and then this is kind of a, a general question. Melody, we'll start with you as well. Um, but how, do you, how would you describe in, in the coursework, the course load? Um, I know it's kind of maybe a difficult question since you know we're not students living the experience, but and then beyond that, like the community and students working together, what do you see in, in that regard? And Melody, we'll start with you, and then we'll turn to Tamara as well. Sure. So uh, I kind of have a rule of thumb as an advisor. I don't advise anybody to take more than two of our lab courses um, a semester. Um, if they take three, they better hope they get really good group mates. And if they take four, I hope they don't plan on sleeping for the entire semester. So um, we've talked a lot about that lab component and that lab component can be quite heavy for some of our um, courses. 
we strategically lay them out in the plan of study that we give students to try and balance that load. Now, for a myriad of reasons, sometimes students get out of sync with what, what we've suggested for them, and they may end up with a heavier semester than they perhaps had anticipated. But we have um, uh, BEST uh, within the Polytechnic to help them partner up with students who've already taken the courses and done well. Um, we also encourage them to join, um, we have a CIT majors club for them to join that and then they can spend time with upperclassmen who might be able to help them out if they're struggling in a course with maybe some tips or tricks to help them get through. Um, and of course, if they're struggling um, with course load, we always want them to come and talk with us as advisors. Um, I tell my students that there's no shame in a W, that I would much rather have them drop, drop their load a little bit a semester so that they can be successful in all that they have than have to figure out how we're going to work around a poor grade um, at a later point. So those are all conversations that we have with students and off. Some students sail right through a heavier load. Others who might have to have a job or who might have um, outside responsibilities. Some of our non-traditional students, they're simply not able to carry as heavy a load as others would. So that's things that we as advisors treat each situation very individually and make sure that each student is working at their best capacity level, whatever that is. Tamara, does that sound pretty much what you all do in your department as well? Most definitely, most definitely. We try really hard to get to know our students, to know where they're coming from, what do they need. Maybe this isn't their best semester. We need to take a step back and then they can maybe pick up a summer class or do something a little bit more later on. You know, you work with students where they are and you encourage them as much as possible. We also have, again, just like Melody, we usually encourage around 15 hours a semester. Now we may have up to three labs in a semester. Like Melody, I really don't like students to have four. And again, five, yeah, you're probably not sleeping a whole lot, but I've had students do it and it all depends on your level of motivation and what it is you wanna do. We have a lot of students that form study groups. I've had students come to me and say, okay, this is the elective that we're all gonna take. I mean, and they're talking about five or six of them in a group are gonna take this particular class together because they enjoy working together. They, they know how each other thinks, they know how to help each other out, and that's what they do. And I have found our students to be really, really cool that way. And just very, very, yeah, it, it's really nice. It's a really nice community sense. It's a really nice environment um, for everybody to be in there. And of course, we always encourage students to, anytime they're having problems or whatnot, go and talk to your professor. Their doors are open, talk to your lab TAs. Some of them are not that far removed from the class that you're having problems with. So we try to give as much help and reassurance and guidance as we possibly can. Right, that's, that's <laughs> sure. um, one, well, I guess one thing I want to talk about, since you, you mentioned, you know, getting to know your students and, and working with them on their plan of study, their workload, what does that registration, course registration, that conversation look like, especially when, you know, as incoming freshmen, as these students will be, um, the STAR process, summer transition advising and registration. Um, what happens during that day and then beyond that, what happens, you know, during your normal semester meetings to talk about that plan of study and coursework? Amber, we'll start with you. Well, um, again, we do, we have, we ask all of the students as they're coming in to fill out that student information form. That gives us a lot of great information. So we kind of know where they're coming from, what maybe some of their background is, and maybe what are they looking to do? I especially like to know if I've got an ROTC student or a band student because they need different schedules. They've got different requirements for things that we need to talk about and make sure that we are hitting those classes, hitting those times. You know, if they're in, in Purdue Music Organizations, there are thir certain things they need to be available for. So spend a lot of time talking about that. Not all departments will take Project Lead the Way credit, but we take quite a bit of it. So that's another conversation we have with our students is, do you have Project Lead the Way credit? How can we use that on your plan of study? So a lot of very individualized conversations. What credit are you bringing in? Um, how do you feel about math? You know, maybe, maybe, you know, your teacher was just really easy and but you don't feel like you've got a good grounding in math and you want to take the step back in math before you really progress into Purdue math or maybe 
you're just a calculus god and you are just ready to go. You know, I mean, we, we truly try to have conversations about where are you? What are you interested in? What do you want to do? And of course, freshmen always start off with they all want to do everything. They want to be part of every club. They want to do a double major and maybe maybe combine the master's program in there and maybe a couple minors. And we wait till after the first year. We we don't talk about major. We don't talk about doubles or minors until after the first year. They got to get their feet wet. They need to see where they're coming from because it's really it's really easy to to get excited about everything that you can do. So a lot of our star conversation is kind of well, let's find out what you're interested in. Let's go from there. And you mentioned the student information form. When do students fill that out? And, and Tamara, you start with you and then Melody, do you, does your department use that same information form as well? It, the student information form is located on their new student tab and we want them to fill it out three days prior at the minimum before they come to STAR so that we get a chance, we get it, we can take a look at it. I read through mine so that I know who is coming, where are they from, um, you know, because sometimes, hey, I've got, I might have somebody from Texas and that's always kind of fun for me to meet a fellow person from the South and all of that good stuff. But, you know, we go through those forms, we take a look, we try to see what credit do they have, what math have they placed into. But we like for them to fill that information out at least three days prior to their coming to STAR so that we have a chance to get it and review it and then use it during our STAR meetings. And at that time, we're gonna talk about the classes that they're gonna take for the fall. And we're gonna come up with a list of classes as well as a few alternates, just in case something doesn't work the way that we wish it would. Certain classes are going to fill, like the comm or the math, or the not the math, but the comm or the English, and we want to have an alternative. And so we work hard to do that too. We want to make sure all freshmen start off with that nice 15 to 16 hours. Sure, yeah, that makes sense. And Melody, for you, are going to use the same form as well? So, Ryan, I've been told we do use that form. I've not been through a STAR registration yet since I just started in October in academic advising, but I imagine from the stories that I've heard that our advising process is very similar to Tamara's. Yeah. Right, I think that it makes sense. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, real quick, I want to I pivot and just kind of respond to a couple of questions from the chat that we've been getting. Um, and Tamara, you mentioned in the information forum, you talk about AP and potential dual enrollment credits as well, kind of how that works out. And I know Purdue has a, a good website that talks through and goes through all the different AP courses and how those credits come into Purdue, but obviously you know that and kind of work with the students on it as well. Um, some other things um, that I want to bring up. I know right now we just we're kind of limited in, in terms of our representation of our departments with just a couple um, here, but um, I want to point out on our website, um, there's some resources for all of our departments. Um, so if you have questions about aviation or construction, computer graphics, technology, leadership and innovation, I know we have some students who are trying to respond to questions in the chat right now, uh, but if you go to polytechnic.purdue.edu and then click on the admitted students link on that front page, there are department documents for each of our departments for your admitted uh, department. So that way you can read through that and see what kind of information is shared through what you would have gotten if you came to campus and visited with us. There's also contact information for all of our academic advisors. Definitely recommend sending them an email. Um, they're gonna be working with our current students on the online virtual registration advising uh, process. So send them an email with any questions you have um, in terms of coursework, credit work um, that could, could transfer in, um, how to change your major. That's also a good question for the Office of Admissions. Um, they're currently working through the process right now up until May 1st, I believe, maybe even June 1st, they're gonna work through that. Um, but any admissions and changing major questions that you have, um, at least in terms of right now, if you wanna try to change your major, that's a process you can do through your admissions portal, but also contact the Office of Admissions to make sure you're doing everything properly and submitting those forms. Um, you, like we talked about before, you can change your major once you're already enrolled, um, if there's some potential, some some pro, uh, processes, that you, processes that you go through and uh, change of degree objective requirements of a GPA or certain coursework that you have to have completed. Um, but right now, if you're looking at trying to change your major, Office of Admissions is definitely where you want to go to uh, to get those questions answered specifically. And Tammy, you have something to add? 
If, if I can just interject really quickly too, I know I've already been getting one or two questions about the summertime. Normally we would have STAR, this the summer transition and registration time frame where students do get an opportunity to sit down with their assigned advisor, talk about their classes, go through all of this. We don't know exactly what's going to be happening this summer, but I do want to reassure everybody that even if you don't get a chance to sit down face to face with your advisor, you're still going to be assigned an advisor. They're going to be in contact with you either over Skype or over email. There's going to be some way of making contact so that we can get all of your questions answered and get everything taken care of so students are ready for the fall semester. And we're working very hard on that, but we're still kind of waiting to see what's going to happen with STAR. I don't think a decision has been made yet. Yeah, I think everything right now is is decided up until about May 2nd. I think as we see things progress or change and hopefully get better for the world at this point, um, the summer will go forward like it always does. Um, so we'll just kind of, as Timer did, finger, fingers crossed and, and hope everything goes forward. Um, and I did, had, did see one question and then I'll, uh, I'm gonna respond to myself and then turn it to the advisors. Um, in terms of honors college, I know that the idea with the honors college is very interdisciplinary learning. Um, so we had a question is, would you live with other students outside of the majors of the polytechnic? And that is absolutely true. They try to mix students in, in the honors college and residences if you end up living there um, with students from all over the university. So that way you have that interaction and bring those ideas together um, in the different courses that you take. Um, so there are some courses that the Honors College does provide. And then um, beyond that, um, maybe could could one of the advisors and, and Melody you know, start with you. Um, how does the Honors course work fit in with the plans of study? Is there ways to adjust current and, and required courses within the department to fulfill those requirements as well? Sure. Um, if a student wants to take one of our required courses as an Honors course, that's a contract that they um, put together with the uh, instructor and I sign off as, a, as their advisor and their honors advisor signs off on it and then they do additional work for that course to have it have the honors designation. But we're very open to um, our coursework being offered as honors coursework and oftentimes they will take some of their minor subjects um, as honors designated courses as well. So that pretty much nearly any course at the university can be taken for an honors designation. It's just a simple contract that's drawn up between the student and the instructor with the advisor's um, awareness and blessing on that. And Tamara, is that uh, engineering technology does that as well? We do that as well. Again, we've got quite a few honor students. They'll meet their honors requirements sometimes with like the COM 114 honors, which is the freshman level speech communication course. There are definitely some courses specifically designated as honors, but again, we have many professors, I would argue probably most of them, sometimes if the course really doesn't adapt to an honors load, they'll let you know, but I don't know of any that really don't. And again, most of the professors are all willing to work with a contract and make it work so that you can get that extra honors credit. Because you have to have so many to to maintain your honor status. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And, and Mark, since you know you were kind of representing our faculty here tonight, is has that been a situation you've uh, been a part of as well with honor students? Um, I haven't had a whole lot of uh, honor students come through uh, my classes, although I've got one now. Um, I'm I'm actually teaching an honors class over in the honors college this semester, and in one of these classes, I've always wanted to teach. Like, oh, they said yes, so I'm in. And one of my students in that honors class is also in my statics class. So it's in the, the few times I've had this, it's just as they describe, they, they need to do some extra work as part of their honors contract. And you know, this is the kind of thing we really, we really should encourage. I mean, it's there's you know, it's a little extra work for us, but geez, that's not a good reason to say no. Um, I don't I don't think I've ever turned anybody down when they asked. It's a, you know, it, it's when you've got a student who's that bright who wants to uh, do something like that you know with, with their education and try to forward their careers I mean, who's going to say no to that <laughs> yeah that that definitely makes sense obviously we're we're here to be supporters of their success and, and help them get down that path that they want to go into for sure um, and we did have a question and, and just want to clarify so the coursework that the engineering technology department has is there any overlap or courses that are required to 
or available to take from the College of Engineering as well? And Mark maybe could start and respond to that and then follow up with Tamara. Yeah, not as far as I know. Um, the, the, one, the one place I've had a little bit of overlap is I teach a class, it's MET 349. It's stringed instrument design and manufacturing. So you actually start literally with a clean sheet of paper and we design and build guitars, electric guitars. At the end of the semester, everybody walks away with their own custom made electric guitar. So, you know, it's a fun class. It's a lot of work. I mean, if you're looking for an easy A, that's probably not the place to go, but it's it's a, a really invigorating class, really good learning environment. Um, I have had uh, engineering students come over there and, you know, of course, are they're welcome. And it was, as I understand, it was just pretty much a matter of them uh, getting permission from their own advisors to count that as uh, probably a technical elective or something like that. So that's that's my only experience with it. The, the advisors will know more than I do. Yeah, Tamara, do you want to give us some more insight on that? No, no problem at all. I'm happy to do so. Basically, I hate to say it's kind of sort of a one-way street. We'll take a lot of their classes. They don't take hardly any of ours. So if a student has taken statics or thermodynamics with us, the engineering department's going to make them take their version of it. But we will accept the engineering version of it. Um, same is true with calculus and with physics. So it's unfortunately a bit of a one-way street. There are, I mean, of course, the core curriculum, the English, the, the, the gen eds, and all of those classes, those, those go everywhere, right? Because we've all got those requirements. But in terms of major specific classes, no, it's usually, um, yeah, if you're an engineering student, if they're willing to accept ours, then you can do it. We will generally accept theirs. Again, there are going to be some that we don't accept because, frankly, they don't have the lab. They don't do the lab experience. And so students who have taken thermodynamics over in engineering will come over to us. They want to use that credit. We're going to make them take a heat lab because they don't have a lab experience in engineering. They, they just have the theory, the theory behind it. So it's kind of a, maybe a little bit of a mixed bag, but I don't know if that really answers the question. No, I think it does. Yeah, I think, the, the, I guess the general point is the curriculum overlap just isn't there. It doesn't exist in most cases. Our, our plans of study are designed how they are to accomplish the goals and get the students to learn what they're supposed to and required to for the degree. Is that fair? Our program is very lab specific and very lab centered. Um, the engineering program is not, and that's not a fault on their part. It's not a criticism on their part at all, but they just don't quite have the lab background that our students do. They have a stronger conceptual and maybe more theoretical at times. Um, but again, we it doesn't always work because they just don't have the labs. So, but you know, some of them do, but they usually, engineering usually will not accept our courses. Okay, that's fair, good to know. Um, let's see here. And, and Melody, another question for you, kind of specific to cybersecurity. Are there any specific languages, coding languages that students maybe want to get a jump start on or um, take, you know, just kind of learn on their own ahead of time or things that maybe want to get a little bit ahead of prepared for um, that, that cybersecurity or CIT department in general uh, focuses in on? Sure. The the really the only thing I hear my students um, complain that they didn't know much about was Raspberry Pi. So if they have an opportunity to play with that before they come, that's great. Um, C Sharp, uh, they utilize that in quite a few of the labs. And I can't think of what the third language is, but if they've got a background in several different languages, um, they'll be fine and they can utilize that whatever their level is, they're going to have an experience where they can connect at that level and then build on their skills. That makes sense, yeah. Um, and then Mark, I know you're you're part of the you know, your faculty with an MET. Um, could you share any any information, or do, could, do you have any inf any background or info about the robotics program or how that that kind of looks here? We got a question from the chat that someone was wondering about. Boy, um, it's a fairly new program, uh, at least compared to MET. MET is I don't know, forty years old, maybe something like that, and uh, actually more than that now. Anyway, um, it's it's built along all the same. 
uh, uh, fundamental concepts as the rest of our programs, and it's very hands-on. Um, Tamara is the is the uh, robotics five hundred that they run around the the building every semester. That's that's part of robotics, right? Noi five hundred, yes, that's run by uh, Professor Boyles, and it has to do with uh, dealing with programmable remote operated systems, those little race cars, and they they program those so that they they operate remotely. Okay. Yes. So what that looks great like, course. yeah, great course. What what that looks like is at the end of the semester, you, one of your projects, and I, I assume the project, is they run a race around the, the our, our building has kind of a loop around the, the, the first floor. And so there's, you know, there's checkered flags all over the place, but there's also transceivers all over the place. And so the teams build a little race car from a, 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 a kit of parts, and they have to program this thing to run that loop autonomously. They don't get to run along behind it and steer it. And just the way it works, my my door over here is is right at one of the corners. So, I, you know, my door is open all the time. So when that race is on, about once an hour, some car will roar, roar in and hit the wall or hit my toolbox back here or something. It, it's a hoot. And the here's the thing, though. When it doesn't seem like that great an insight that when students are really worked up, really interested in something, they're going to put a lot of work into it and they're going to learn more. Okay, who knew? So I watch these students and I mean, you talk about just raw human potential running around. They're, they're, they, uh, you know, a lot of the cars at first, sometimes not, not maybe as robust as they could be. By the end of it though, most of them work fine and they've got a leaderboard and times and everything else. And they're, they're just so cranked up about this. And it looks to me like the work they're doing is really first rate. I mean, this is this is the kind of thing that's going to make them better engineers, and it's going to make them better employees. It's, this is great. All right, great. Thank you for sharing that. That's good. To do that. I've I've been walking around the 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 floor, the first floor here, and you'll hear all clear, all clear, and then they'll start running, and you see the students running behind, making sure their car does what it's supposed to. And if not, they they try to pick it up real quick before it runs into anybody. It's it's quite an experience. Okay, well, just just so you know, last semester, um, it turned out my open door was faking out somebody's. I think it was a sonar sensor, and so I went. The, the guitar lab is off site right now, but it was downstairs. So I went down and cut a board and put it across my doorway for them, so their sensor would have something to see. So instead of going in my office, I kept getting the, it kept hitting the wall about two feet over from my door. So when the race was over, the the uh, uh, building maintenance guys had to come and spackle over all the dents. <laughs> you look at that wall over there. If you could somehow X-ray, you'd see there's all this spackling putty all over it under the paint. That's fine. That's that's easy to fix. It's just, it's just <laughs> that's sheet rock. Uh, Nobody yeah. here minds. I, I will say too, Ryan, robotics is a really cool kind of an intersection between electronic and mechanical. It's kind of a nice intersection between the two majors, as is mechatronics. Robotics, I think, is a little closer to the electrical side, or maybe I've got that backwards. I always get them a little bit mixed up, but both mechatronics and robotics are kind of that intersection between electric and mechanical. So it's a great way, if you're not really certain about which one, and you really kind of think you're kind of, you know, you like both mechanical and electronical or electric, take a look at robotics and mechatronics. Could be a great fit. And again, it's a nice major to do a dual with. You can really combine those easily. Oh, very cool. Good to know for sure. Um, and one of the question um, in terms of academic advisors and how they're assigned and when they're assigned to students, when does that happen? Um, I, I think before STAR, but when will the students know who their advisor is that they'll be working with? Oh, that's a good question. And this year, I'm not, I don't know if I know the exact answer to that. We usually sit down um, and we take a look at who's coming, who has signed up for STAR, and uh, we take a look also at our advising loads because it doesn't make sense if you've already got, you know, a bazillion students to make it a bazillion and two, right? So we do try to balance our loads amongst us. And there are five advisors in the School of Engineering Technology. Um, Students will definitely know before their start date. Um, 
I'm trying to think. Usually, as soon as we're getting the list, we're signing and kind of going from there. So it's usually early summer. We've got to get through graduation and first, you know, get through registration. And then we got to get through graduation, clearing our students for graduation. That's a big thing that takes place mid-May, of course. After that, we start working on STAR. So students may not know who their assigned advisor is, at least with the School of Engineering Technology, until mid-May. They'll know before they come to STAR, though. Okay, well, that's good. They'll at least have that, that name to... We always send out an appointment reminder a few days ahead of time saying, hey, I'm going to, you know, this is my name. I'm going to meet with you on this date at this time. So we send out a nice little sheet. And that, at that point in time, we'll also say, hey, looked at your math scores. I want you to retake Alex. Or you haven't done the student information form. Or it looks great. I'm looking forward to meeting you. You know, it's just a little reminder. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> Kelly, I seem very similar with CIT and other departments as well. I, I'm not really in here. sure with CIT how we do advisor assignment with STAR, but I'm very sure that we communicate them with them well in advance and let them know what to expect when they get to campus for their STAR date. Uh -huh. All right. And, tonight, and, and Tamara, you mentioned the math placement, um, the Alex assessment. How does math placement work um, just kind of in, in general with, with Purdue? Well, um, we have a couple of different ways of determining which math you can go into. One, if you've got credit or if you think you have credit, we're going to kind of work with your best guess at that point in time. The way that we are doing batch registration, you'll actually be, if you've got credit for Calc 1 and you want to move into Calc 2, we're going to make that happen. Um, but if you're not certain, we look usually at your SAT scores or your AC, ACT scores. Based upon that, we can make a recommendation. If we're not really certain, or if you're not really certain as a student, taking the Alex placement test is just a great indicator of how much knowledge you have. It doesn't do you any good to try to get a high score on it, because then maybe you are trying to put yourself into a Calc 1 class when really you would be better off repeating pre-Cal or doing pre-Cal for that matter. So um, the Alex test is just, it's a math assessment test. It's, I don't think it's terribly painful. Um, you can take it up to five different times, um, but we will use those scores. If you don't have the SAT to get you where you want to be, then we're going to make you take an Alex. That makes sense? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just knowing that the SAT is one option for them to get placed and then the Alex is, the, is another way if they want to try to get into something higher, right? The School of Engineering Technology, we really want to start with Calc 1 whenever possible. We have no problem starting with pre-Cal. That is not a problem at all. But we do have a calculus requirement that is part of your degree requirement. So we want you into calculus relatively earlier on as compared to later. But again, we're going to work with you where you are. All right, great. And then along the same lines with STAR, there's also a virtual STAR uh, for students who live further away, maybe don't want to make the trip for just one day on campus, spend that money. Obviously, we get that. So there's the option to request a virtual STAR. How does that work for advising them? That's going to be kind of different for us this year. We're excited. We should be getting Skype cameras so we can actually Skype and talk to our students face to face. That's not been something the School of Engineering Technology has been able to do recently. We have usually done it then mostly via email, again, going off that student information sheet, taking a look at what the students are interested in and what we think they might have credit for. And then we send them, this is what we think you should take for classes. We help them register for that. Um, again, it's, it's not quite as personal. Um, you don't really get a chance to meet your advisor till you're actually on campus, and that part's a little bit more unfortunate. I'm hoping with Skype that will be a little bit better, and we're excited about that uh, that new possibility for us. But otherwise, we do it over email, and again, we try to do our best to give as much of the experience as we can and see what we can do to get to know students. Yeah, I think we're all in that boat now of let's learn how to do things virtually. And, you know, Virtual Star has been around for quite a while. Um, but yeah, having that that face to face at the very least with Skype would be a, a great personal touch for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Um, so there's a couple more questions that I want to respond to from the chat. Um, the first of which was about credit that students are currently trying to earn from high school to finish out their diploma and how that would look if if they're not able to finish those those requirements now that is something that i haven't seen specifically information yet from the office of admissions on how that will look or potentially affect 
our students who have been admitted. Uh, I imagine that there will be some information shared soon if there is any impact for those situations. You are welcome, like I mentioned before, contact the Office of Admissions to see if you are expecting that to be a situation for you. Reach out to them and, and either give them a call, send them an email. Their phone number is area code 765-494-1776 or admissions at purdue.edu. Office of Admissions, um, I think it's admissions.purdue.edu as well as their website or just Google it. That's how I usually find it too. Um, definitely reach out to them if you have those types of questions about you're expecting or potentially expecting those, those situations to happen for you. Um, for any sort of financial aid or scholarships, uh, the division of financial aid would be able to answer those questions about Scholarship Universe. The, the, that's the website that Purdue has started using this year to support uh, scholarships that our students can apply for. Reach out to them if you have any questions about anything that you think would be pertinent for your scholarship applications or your financial aid package that you received. Um, they're, the, they're the resource for talking through all those grants and loans and scholarships that you received. Um, yeah, definitely reach out to them if you have any specific questions for those types of things. Um, but we are certainly here to, to answer anything as well. I want to I wanna wrap up here, um, just starting with Tamara. Um, do you have any advice uh, for incoming freshmen, you know, finishing up a very different senior year than we're used to, obviously, um, but anything that you'd want to share of, of what they can expect or what would would be a good reason um, to find themselves here to choose that offer to come to the polytechnic i think the polytechnic offers a lot of really great advantages we have um very much open door policies it sounds maybe a little corny to say we care but we do care we we really truly do our best to embody students first in all we do um I think you're going to have a great experience. Come with an open mind. Come with a willingness to try something new and different, maybe different than the way you have been learning, maybe different than the experiences that you've had. Be willing to talk to new people. Um, just come with an open mind and come with the attitude of this is going to be good. Because you know what? It is. I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be just absolutely fabulous. And I think. Just going through this with COVID and everything, we are doing the best we can do and we're doing the best experience we can do for everybody. So know that we are always gonna do our best to make it your best experience. As long as you have that attitude. Awesome. Thanks, and Melody, any words of advice for students out there? Sure, um, I met with all of my second semester freshmen um, in January when the semester started and one of them said something to me in response to the question that I asked them all, which is what is the thing that surprised you most about your freshman year at Purdue? And one of them said, I'm surprised by the fact that the faculty here actually care about whether or not I succeed and you guys know my name and you want to know what I want to do with my life. And they said that they were told that coming into a big university like Purdue, they would never have that experience and it was gonna be up to them to figure it all out on their own. And they were much appreciative that the faculty and the advising staff went above and beyond to make sure that they fit in and that they were doing well in their studies. Ryan, can I pitch in here? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, now you can tell from all the white hair, I went to college a while ago, but um, I had a very different experience. I went to a different school. I didn't go to Purdue, but I went to schools remarkably similar to Purdue. Um, and I didn't have the kinds of things that Melody and, and Tamara are talking about. Um, we didn't have advisors. Nobody knew my name. I'm, I'm almost positive that the day I graduated, there were two professors at that university who could call me by my name. One of them I worked for, and one of them was in the German department. That was it. And, you know, it worked well enough. Here I am. It worked fine. But, you know, I kind of got ground through the mill, and it, it was a very Darwinian experience, frankly. Um, it I was sitting here one time, when my dad happened to be with me. He's, he's 82 now. And some student, I forgot who now, came in just to chat for a minute and walked away. And my dad said, what was that? I said, well, I don't know. I just wanted to come in and say hello. He's, they do that? I said, sure. And we, we talked about it and it occurred to us, you know, he went to engineering school too, but a long, long, long time ago. Um, 
And it never would have occurred to either one of us to do that. It wasn't like we would have thought about it and decided it was a bad idea. We never would have thought about it. Now, was it a meaningful interaction? I don't know. I can't hardly remember it. But the point is that the students come in my office absolutely all the time. And, you know, most of the time they have a purpose, but not always. They come in to show me their new skateboard and I ride their skateboard down the hallway. It's great. So it's we're, we're doing everything we can to connect with our students and we're trying very hard to be the professors we needed. I think that's that's a good outlook to have as, as in your role and same with the advisors and, and good for our students to know that that's what we're here to do. And, and I, I echo the same thing for um, my office, the Office of Recruitment and Retention and Diversity. There's five of us and we are certainly in this new situation trying to come up with new ways to connect with you to answer your questions, to get the information that you need to, to learn about Purdue, about the Polytechnic and, and make that college choice to join us here. Um, one thing that we've actually just created just yesterday was a web form for you to fill out to re request and schedule a call with one of our staff members if you have some specific questions. So if you want to go to polytechnic.purdue.edu backslash call. You can submit a request to get a call from one of our staff and we'll be happy to talk with you. You can certainly give us a call as well. Um, our phone number is area code 765-494-4935. That's our main office. Our contact information is on the website. Um, our phones are redirected to our cell phones, so please give us a call, send us emails. We want to hear from you. We want to answer those questions. Um, our Facebook group, we have social media out there, our YouTube channel with this broadcast and others as well. All of this, all of these things we're trying to do, we're trying to make sure you have that information you need and get those questions answered. So don't feel shy about reaching out to us because we want to hear from you and, and we're going to keep sending out information as best we can. As updates come out, Office of Admissions and Purdue in general is going to be doing the same thing. We're going to be trying to provide these opportunities and these resources um, in these very strange and new times, but we're all adjusting and we're going to make it work as best that we can. So um, thank you all very much for joining us tonight. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen in on our conversation. Um, thank you, Tamara, Melody, and Mark as well for joining us and sharing your insights. Um, this hopefully is a, is a good way for, to, to get out there. We have another broadcast coming up on April 14th. Um, that will include some of our current students. Um, that, that way you can learn a little bit more about the student life, the student perspective, what it's like being in the Polytechnic and, and at Purdue here in West Lafayette. Um, I also want to thank our student ambassadors who have been responding to questions in the chat. Um, we have a website as well for our student ambassadors that you can take a look at and contact students admitted to the same major department as you. Reach out to them. They want to hear from you. They're doing some different things with us as well. So. Like I said, we're trying a whole bunch of things to get out and, and get that information to you and make sure we connect with you as best that we can. So take a look at your emails, keep an eye on social media. We're going to be reaching out. So um, with that, I just want to say thank you all again for joining us tonight. Um, have a great evening. And again, reach out to us if you have any questions. So with that, I'll end up with Boiler Up. Boiler Up. Boiler up.